Hey Shiloh, thanks for tuning into church again. It's awesome having you online, uh, wherever you may be, whatever you might be doing. Um, we're stoked to be able to have you in our house, in our online house, so to speak. If you're ever around in Goodna, pop into church. We'd love to be able to make you feel super welcome. But if you're online, we're stoked to have you here. Why don't you drop your favorite emoji into the chat and uh, or the word that best describes your week uh, coming up. And you're like, well, I haven't, I haven't started my week yet. Well, then throw the word that you want to see happen. Let's let's be people of faith. Um, yeah, I was just thinking, have you ever lived with anybody, right? Ever had like a roommate or a housemate or something? Um, I, I I was thinking about all the funny housemate stories I've had over the years. Um, or maybe you remember the first few months when you got married, what that was like, and adjusting if you weren't living together prior to that, adjusting to what that was all like, right? Um, and maybe you've gone on a holiday with people and you've kind of stayed in an Airbnb together and you've had that experience, right? Uh, and it's amazing, like, doing life with other people and sharing a home with people. That's a great thing. But can we just be real? It does take a little bit of adjusting. Like maybe that you've learned that it's not a good idea to eat Cocoa Pops and get changed and leave all your clothes in the living room while watching NBA because if you do that, it leads to an unhappy marriage or, or um, should I say an, un- an unhappy r- roommate or whatever, hypothetically, haha. <laughs> um, you know, it's it, it, like all jokes aside, like we do have to make adjustments to be able to make the roommate scenario work. But when we do that, there's all these great benefits. They uh, help pay our bills or they uh, do more stuff around the house or um, they, uh, you know, do some trade work or wh- whatever. There's things they bring to the picture that makes it just so much better, right? Accommodating that other person in your life should make things better. I remember, for example, we lived in a, I lived, I uh, was, wasn't married yet, uh, I lived in a bachelor pad, just a boy's bachelor pad uh, before I got married for a little bit. That was, that was pretty interesting. And uh, we had this guy and uh, he, he didn't have a lot of money, but he's like, I'll cook if I don't have to pay as much board as everybody else pays, right? And so even though I'd coming home to his chow mein, which sometimes had been sitting in a pot for two weeks, and I'm not sure why I never got food poisoning, but hey, maybe God was preparing me for the mission field. Um, you know, it's funny, even though he did that, he, he contributed something to the house. And so even though we had to accommodate a few things, it made it work because, you know, he made the house better, right? Now, last week, we did a little bit of an introduction to the Holy Spirit. And so don't turn back now if you've missed it, like just tune in. Um, but, you know, maybe when you finish, you can podcast it or watch last week's message on video, right? Um, and we talked about how to relate to the Holy Spirit, how he wants us to start relating to him as God, yes, but also as like a best friend, right? We talked about how he introduces himself in Genesis 1 uh, verse 2 as the ruah, to use the Hebrew word, which is like um, uh, the, the breath of God or a divine gust of wind or a supernatural air current or whatever. That he's, he's unseen, he's unpredictable, and he's all powerful, right? But what happens when you actually invite him into your heart? So you've made friends with the Holy Spirit and you're like, man, you know, just like when you're, when you're close to somebody, you know, they kind of come into your heart a little bit. When you invite the Holy Spirit into your heart, what's it like? I mean, like he's a roommate, sure, but what's he like as a roommate? What does he do? What does he bring to the table? Does he cook? Does he clean? Is he like a tradie who paints that room that desperately needs painting or fixes that leaking tap in the bathroom that's been leaking for as long as you moved in there? What does the Holy Spirit do as a roommate? Now, someone's probably going to point out, I know, I can tune off. I've heard this before. He's going to talk about the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, goodness, kindness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, Again, such there is no law. Sure, that's in the book of Galatians. It's a great verse, but that's actually not what I'm talking about, right? As brilliant as that is, that verse is talking about the character changes that the Holy Spirit brings. See, it's like this. Uh, when, uh, when, when I got married, Chris and I moved in together, and um, which is good because we were married, <laughs> lol. Um, anyway, we're living together. Krista has been instrumental in changing a lot of the things in my character that needed work, right? Um, she's definitely made me softer, which is good. I was a little harsh when we first got married. Um, she's uh, made me uh, more caring, more kind, more thoughtful, more considerate, quite legitimately. And if you're watching this, babe, I know I pick on you and always joke around. The truth is my wife has definitely radically changed my character for the better, right? But the thing is, she didn't just change my character. It required some lifestyle changes. I couldn't live like a bachelor anymore now that I was married and she was in the home with me, right? We had to change the way we did things. Surprisingly, she didn't want to eat uh, you know, hot dogs and hamburgers every single day. She wanted to mix things up a little bit. And so we changed things in our lifestyle, not just change things in our character. So I know what you're thinking. Ah, oh, tongues. Phil's going to talk about tongues. Tongues, right? That's what we're going to talk about. 
And no, we're not gonna talk about tongues. Well, not really, because that's a gift. That's not a lifestyle. And there's plenty of Christians I know who know how to speak in tongues, but they haven't allowed the Holy Spirit to change their lifestyle. And as a result of him not changing their lifestyle, yes, they're filled with the Holy Spirit. Yes, they can speak in tongues, but their life isn't all it could be or should be, or even all the Holy Spirit wants it to be because he hasn't made the lifestyle changes because they haven't actually let him, right? It's a little bit like, if you move in and your roommate's a tradie, he might have all the skills and abilities to change all of the things that are broken in the house. But if you don't let him, just the fact that he's in there doesn't change it by osmosis. You actually have to give him permission to do that. The same is true of the Holy Spirit. Awesome you speak in tongues. It's great you know how to pray for healing. But have you allowed the Holy Spirit to make the lifestyle changes he wants to make as a roommate of your heart? So I know you're thinking, all right, it's not tongues. It's not the character stuff. What is it then? What kinds of changes does the Holy Spirit want to make? If he is a roommate in my heart, what kinds of things is he going to do, right? Well, if you study scripture and you study what the Holy Spirit does when he encounters people, when they kind of invite him in as a roommate, this is the kind of stuff that you're going to see. Let's start with a simple one. Isaiah 63 verse 14. Isaiah 63 14. Um, you can look it up if you've got like a physical Bible, if you've got a digital Bible, maybe you're watching this on TV, you can load it up on your phone. If you're watching this on a phone or an iPad or something that you normally would read the Bible on, we'll chuck the scripture on the screen. This is what it says. As with cattle going down into a peaceful valley, the Spirit of the Lord gave them rest. You lead your people, Lord, and gained a magnificent reputation. What an interesting verse, right? <laughs> bit, bit, bit of an odd one. It's, um, it's a verse that, like what we read in Genesis last week, refers to the Spirit of God as Ruah, like, uh, you know, like a Holy Spirit wind, a breath, uh, all that kind of stuff, right? But, uh, but it goes a bit deeper than that. So it talks about, right, uh, in a poetic way, that the nation of Israel was like a herd of cattle that the Holy Spirit, like a John Wayne Western, like a cowboy, led into a peaceful valley. So they were safe, they were protected, they were at peace, and that they were rested, right? So the first thing the Holy Spirit wants to do in your heart as your new, new room, uh, roommate, number one, type number one into the chat, say number one if you're out aloud and you're driving and there's nobody else there, all your kids are there. Um, number one, rest. Rest, 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 rest. Number one, rest, right? I know what you're saying, but how is the Holy Spirit going to give me rest, right? See, if the Holy Spirit is working in you and on you and in your life, guess who doesn't have to do all of the work? You. <laughs> so you get a little bit of rest, right? Um, so here, the nation of Israel was tired. They were in need of a miracle. They were sick of fighting. They were under the thumb. And the Holy Spirit is saying he came in and led them to a place of rest. Now, how did they break out of Egypt? Not through their own doing, through the power of God. How did they uh, get led and guided through the wilderness? Not through their own doing, through the power of God. God took some of the things off the plate uh, so they could actually find rest. You know, as I said, I had this, I had this housemate, uh, and he was actually quite a good cook. Like I was joking around about the chow mein. Well, I wasn't really. There was a pot there that I think he washed like once a month. He claimed it was part of his uh, cooking style, but anyway, um, he was actually quite a good cook. Uh, we sampled his thing. He came in almost like a little chef. He cooked his little thing like, here, try my food, see if I'm worth it. And we gave him a discount to do that and a bunch of extra chores, right? He paid some, but he just didn't pay a lot. And so about five nights a week, he would come in and he would cook for absolutely everybody, right? That was the rule. It didn't matter what time you came home from work, a meal was actually ready. Even if you came home late, it was almost like a housewife. Like He'd wrap it up in glad wrap. He'd put it in the fridge for you, right? That was his contribution to the house. And part of what made me, because we took a little house vote, are we going to let this guy become a new roommate? Part of why we voted him in, I was working um, uh, pretty long hours already, but I wanted to do some extra overtime to buy some things that I needed. And I also wanted to spend extra time studying. And I thought, I can take the time that I'm spending cooking every day and doing the extra chores that we would assign him. I can take that time and I can actually redistribute it to either make him more money or I could uh, go out and I could um, do some study or better yet, there are times I'll just be able to kick back, watch TV and rest. That's awesome. So I invited him in. Can you imagine how weird it would be though if even though he was there, even though he was willing to cook, if I came home after working the overtime, after doing the study, and I went and cleaned and, clean and cooked anyway, can you imagine how weird that would be? I'd be doubly exhausted. I'd be doubly wiped out, right? Or can you imagine if uh, he did do that, but I was stressed constantly about what the food was going to like and how he was doing it and how he was going to clean it. I was hovering over his shoulder the whole time. 
after I had worked the air overtime, after I'd done the study, or even crazier, can you imagine if I'm kicking back in front of the TV, watching an action movie or a John Wayne Western or whatever, eating some popcorn, but instead of actually relaxing, all that I'm doing is stressing and worrying about, I wonder if he's gonna cook tomorrow, I hope he's gonna cook tomorrow, he better cook tomorrow, because if he doesn't cook tomorrow, that's not good, I wonder if he's gonna clean, I wonder if how's he gonna clean, is he a good cleaner? Well, well, maybe he'll bow, what if he leaves, what if he doesn't leave? Imagine if I spent the whole time and I stress and make myself so anxious and so worried, right, that I don't actually get stuff done. And I know it's like, well, that's a bit silly. No one would do that. But the thing is, we've all done that, myself included, when it comes to the Holy Spirit, right? There are things that the Holy Spirit wants to do in our lives, which is great. And rather than just trusting that he is going to do those things in our life, rather than just believing that he is actually going to get it done, like maybe we need a new job. Maybe we need healing. Maybe we need help with our kids. Maybe we need a breakthrough in our finances. Maybe uh, he's dealing with an addiction in our hearts or whatever it might be, right? But rather than just trusting him and letting him do his his thing, we're like, man, I hope I get healed. Far out, if I don't get healed, that's going to be a real problem. I need a breakthrough with my kids. What if God doesn't come through? What if they turn out like this? What if, what if, what if, what if, what if, what if? And we stress or we worry. Or we go and do it ourselves. We go, stuff this, I'm going to get it done. And we go and do it ourselves. But the problem is we've already got so much stuff on our plate. We're already so overwhelmed and so exhausted. It's just an extra thing. And no wonder it's exhausting. It's a job that was literally assigned to God, right? So we go and do God's work, okay? Sometimes we don't pull it off, but every now and then, even when we do pull it off, we are absolutely, totally and utterly spent, right? And we wake up in the morning completely exhausted from the day before, and we're not actually that refreshed, and we get started again, right? But the Holy Spirit, the Ruah of God, right, loves us and he's like, chill, (laughs) I got this. I love you. I can heal you. It's fine. Leave it with me. I love your kids more than you do. It's fine. Leave them with me. I understand that you're stressed about the finances. I own the cattle on a thousand hills. It's fine. Leave it with me, right? And we have to be able to trust that the Holy Spirit is actually going to do his job. And if we don't do that, then unfortunately what happens is we never find ourselves in a place of rest. And I actually think that, um, you know, uh, people talk a lot about being a spirit-filled believer, you know, and what it means to be a spirit-filled believer. And they talk about the importance of yelling out breakthrough. They talk about wrestling with the devil and demonic attacks. They talk about Pokemon being bad or good or whatever, you know, and they go through all of those kinds of things, right? And, um, you know, we go on about tongues and we go on about this thing and that thing. and, And all that stuff's very interesting. I've preached on all of that before if you've been in our church a while. You know that, right? But here's the thing, when we go on about that and we ignore this, we actually miss one of the best parts of having the Holy Spirit as a roommate of your heart, and that is rest, right? That is rest. And the proof that you are actually resting in the Holy Spirit is that you feel the peace of the Holy Spirit in your heart, okay? So if you're not feeling the peace of the Holy Spirit right now as you're watching this, one of two things is happening. Either you're not actually knowing how to rest, which you've got to go on a journey and figure out, or the other thing is you might be in the wrong spot. The Holy Spirit might be like, I don't want you resting here. I want you resting here, okay? So the way he leads us is through rest and through peace, right? But deeper than that, if you dig a little bit deeper, one of the qualities I think, right, that we need to develop in our lives as spirit-filled believers is actually learning how to enter that peaceful valley and follow his leading there, right? And, uh, And enjoying all the rest that it brings, right? It's an important quality to develop because... It's a byproduct of how well you trust the Holy Spirit and how much faith you have in the Holy Spirit. It's not just about the level of emotional control you have over your own emotions and your own heart and your own life, right? In fact, when I hang out with people that really know how to rest, you know those people? (laughs) They're annoying, right? Those are the people that never seem to get too stressed, never seem to get too worked up. They always know how to lean on the Holy Spirit when they find themselves overwhelmed. What it actually says about those people, which is why I actually love hanging out with them, it says they have such a high level of trust with the Holy Spirit, such a high level of faith with the Holy Spirit, and a high level of emotional control, they are able to rest in ways that we can't rest, okay? So if you're watching this and you're like, man, I don't even know how to do that, just get started somewhere. Just actually say to the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, I need your help with this. Holy Spirit, give me some pointers on this. Holy Spirit, give me some guidance on this. Get in the habit of leaning in on the Holy Spirit. Say to the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, I trust that you've got my kids. Holy Spirit, I have faith that you are going to bring a miracle in my body. And begin to say that kind of stuff and then cast your cares to God, right? Um, The kingdom of this world is built around rhythms of striving, got to work hard, I've got to do this, I've got to get stuff done. But the kingdom of God is built around rhythms of rest, 
right? Psalm 23, famous psalm. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not what? He makes me lie down by green pastures. It starts by introducing rest. Things revolve around rhythms of rest in the kingdom of God, right? So learn to lean into the rest seasons that the Holy Spirit gives us, right? But that also takes us to the next quality about the Holy Spirit that he wants to do as a roommate, right? Um, it's right here, in fact, in this very scripture. You don't even look up anything different. It says, you lead your people, Lord, and have gained a magnificent reputation. You lead your people, Lord, and gained a magnificent reputation, which is a very interesting way of putting it because the first part of the verse is very poetic. It talks about like cattle going down into a peaceful valley. And in case you've missed it, God just gets very, very simple, very, very blunt. He says that he leads his people, right? He leads his people. So the first half of the verse is about focus and the second half of the verse is about direction, okay? First half's about focus, second half is about direction, which brings me to my next point. Number two, type number two in the chat. So number two out loud if you're vacuuming and no one can hear you. Number two, focus and direction. Focus and direction, right? Focus and direction go hand in hand. And um, yes, they are technically two different things and I've preached about them in two different ways. But when you have the Holy Spirit in your life and you ask for one, he will want to give you the other. He he, he generally doesn't want to separate them, right? Because think about this, the directions is is kind of like a recipe. So, you know, he might have the recipe for the world's best chocolate cake. It might be like Jamie Oliver times 10. And he comes up to you and he says, do you want to bake this cake together? And you're like, Wow, this looks amazing. Yes, I want to do that. So you jump into the kitchen. You're in the kitchen with the Holy Spirit, uh, you know, and he says to you, here's what we'll do. Uh, You focus on getting the ingredients out and put them on the bench. I'll focus on getting the pots and the pans and all the little cooking utensils we're going to need, right? And so you put them on that bench. And then he's like, okay, cool. Um, I'm going to get you to take uh, the blender and beat the eggs. And I'm going to go make sure we've got the cream whipped. So I'll go and do that right now. And then you've done that. You're like, cool. Can you focus on putting the oven on? And I'm going to do, and you go backwards and forwards and there's a harm harmony that's taking place. And at the end of that, the chocolate cake is good. If you don't have focus in the kitchen when you're cooking with somebody else, even if the cake turns out delicious, it is carnage behind the scenes. Two people are beating eggs at the same time. I, I, I was beating eggs. I thought you were beating No, I was, I was doing it. And then they're arguing and then they're both using the same spoon. And it's just absolute chaos. Even though the cake tastes good at the end of it, the process required to do that is exhausting, right? And that's often what happens with us when we lack the focus of the Holy Spirit in our lives. It's not that we don't produce fruit. It's not that good things don't come out of our life. There is the fruit of the Spirit, of course. But it's the carnage and the chaos required to pull that fruit out because we don't have the focus of the Holy Spirit to match the direction of the Holy Spirit, right? Uh, You know, maybe you've even looked at the directions of the Holy Spirit and you're like, man, that's a lot. I mean, I don't know about you. I, at times, if I'm just being real, I find my life a little bit overwhelming. I look at it and I'm like, Phew, wow, that's a lot. And it's like, where do I actually get started on? That's a complicated recipe. It's got 57 steps and three pages of ingredients. You need the focus of the Holy Spirit because he'll say, don't worry about 57 steps. We're just at step one. Get the ingredients and put them on the bench. It's okay. The cake will turn out fine. We need the focus of the Holy Spirit because if we don't, we'll find ourselves super overwhelmed, right? And what will happen is we love God. We're workhorses. We'll get through to the end of the year. Hey, New Year's Eve, stream is popping all that. We wake up the next morning and we're like, praise God, last year was done. Yes, some really great stuff came out of it, but thank God it's done. We're exhausted. We're spent. And we look at the next year and we think to ourselves, I don't know if I can do that again. (laughs) That's not what the Holy Spirit wants. He actually doesn't want you exhausted. He doesn't want you spent. He doesn't want you feeling that way. So in order to combat that, he wants to give you focus combined with direction. Focus combined with direction. So if you're feeling overwhelmed, first of all, I get it. (laughs) We all get it. We've all been there. But secondly, I would say, if you're feeling overwhelmed, lean into the Holy Spirit and say, please give me some focus and some direction. What do I need to do here, right? But interestingly, I actually think this is one of those things that's actually almost more important for people that are not overwhelmed and feel like they're on top of things. Because those kinds of people, and we've all been there too, wander around going, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. My focus is this. My direction is that. I'm going to make this happen. I'm going to make that happen. God, can you bless this? God, can you bless that? And as great as all of that is, and I love the drive and I love the passion and so does the Holy Spirit. He's super impressed. He just has one question. Do you know what's going to happen tomorrow or next month or next year or in five years? 
No, you don't. I don't. We all don't. But the Holy Spirit actually does, right? <laughs> yeah, my family life's fine. Is it? Yep, it's fine. I've looked at it. It's fine. Hmm. But I'd focus on that. Well, I don't think so, Holy Spirit. I've got some other areas I want to focus on. Really? Do you know what's going to happen tomorrow? No. Well, I do. And in this season, your family's going to need you more than ever. So you should start focusing on them now before there's an issue so that it prevents an issue so that you can sail through this thing. So how about this? <laughs> you focus on your kids in this season at the start and I'll focus on your wife and I'll speak to her. So you do a little bit and then he's like, okay, cool. The kids are good. I want you to focus on your marriage right now and I will focus on the circle of friends around your kids. And you go backwards and forwards like cooking in the kitchen together and you bring a turnaround and you bring a miracle in your marriage and in your kids and in your family. You have to let him lead you though, right? Because he knows what the interest rate is next year. You don't. You know, he knows who the PM will be in three years. You don't, right? Uh, he knows where your kids are going to be next month. You don't. He knows what your health journey will be like in 18 months. You don't. So don't be the one that dictates the focus and direction on your life. Allow the Holy Spirit to lead you and guide you and give you the focus and direction you need. Because yes, there are times when you can do it on your own, but it is absolutely exhausting. And God's will for you is not for you to be constantly exhausted because you're fighting through all of this sort of stuff on your own. Take his direction and his focus. Okay, so you've given him the keys to the house, great. He's getting things done onto your to-do list and you're more relaxed than you've ever been before, great. He's given you some focus and direction and he's even written it down on some sticky notes and put it on the fridge so that you can't forget it and you're like, that's great. What does the Holy Spirit do next? Surely he's gonna kick up his feet and make a cup of tea. And you would think that, but the Holy Spirit is a bit of a machine when it comes to getting stuff done around the house. That's why he makes such a great roommate, right? So he's there and he has a look around. The cake's in the oven. It's about to come out. And he notices that the rubbish hasn't been taken out. He looks at the carpet. He thinks it hasn't been vacuumed in a while. He did remember walking past the bedroom that you haven't made a bed in, in you know, since 1998. And uh, he thinks, okay, we need to get some stuff done. But what he does next with that is a little bit surprising if you haven't had a lot of experience with the Holy Spirit, right? Um, if you've got a Bible, Romans chapter 8, verse 9. Romans chapter 8, verse 9. We'll chuck it on the screen again. Um, but, you know, Romans chapter 8, verse 9. I'm reading from the New Living. It says, But you are not controlled by your sinful nature. You are controlled by the Spirit if you have given the Spirit. Uh, if you have the Spirit of God living in you. Let me say that again. You're not controlled by your sinful nature. You are controlled by the Spirit if you have the Spirit of God living in you. <laughs> I love this verse so much because it's both very comforting and very challenging in a way. It's comforting because I don't know about you, but I think all of us have stuff in our life that we need to attend to. We've all got some rubbish. We've all got that junk room in our heart that you know we put a whole bunch of stuff in that's a mixture of like, it's random, I'm not sure where to go with that. And also like, oh, that stuff's not good, but I don't really want to see it. So we put that there, right? Um, and so we've all got that sort of stuff in our life and in our heart. And if we're really honest, we've all got some sin stuff too. We've all got some sin issues. You've got them, I've got them, everybody's got them, right? And, 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 and what's really frustrating isn't like, you know, someone cuts you off in traffic and you, you swear and you, you ask God for repentance and, you, you know, you, you repent, you ask God to forgive you, he forgives you. I find those things aren't the most frustrating. For me, it's when you find yourself doing the same thing again and again and you're so frustrated and you're like, I said I wasn't going to do this. I promised God it was going to be different. We get really agitated. We get really frustrated. And then the devil heaps guilt on us and we think, I'm probably the worst Christian in this whole church. I'm probably the worst Christian in my street. I'm probably the worst Christian. And, you know, we start to, we go on a downward spiral, right? And then I read this verse, and I absolutely love this verse. This verse is super encouraging, right? Because even though we feel distant from God, we're like, I can't worship properly. I can't go to church properly. I'm just going to watch it online. I'm not going to be in the building or whatever, right? We feel like we need to create this space between us and God because of our sin and because of the fact that we can't get it right. When I read this verse, this verse doesn't say that happens because you're a, 
you know, you're a scumbag Christian, you're the worst of the lot, you're the one that he's embarrassed by. It says the reason that this happens is because you're human. And every now and then as humans, we encounter something that we actually don't have the power and authority to win over, right? And so we wrestle with it and it loses. We try our absolute best to get rid of all the rubbish and it just seems to be piling up faster than we can take it out. That nappy smell, we just try to get rid of it in the house. We can't seem to get rid of it. It's hanging around, right? And so that's why he's saying, if you bring me in as the Holy Spirit, I will take control of the cleaning. This is wild. He's not saying, I will walk around and point out all of the things that you haven't done, right? He's saying, I have noticed those things, but here's what I want to do. Give me control of the cleaning. I am the master cleaner and I will actually go and get it done, right? Because he has the ability to get rid of stains of sin that you can't get rid of. He has the ability to declutter things that you're not sure how to declutter. He even knows how to deal with that junk room in your heart. He is absolutely unbelievable. You know, I've said it before a couple times, sort of like half joking, but the Holy Spirit is, you know, I've joked, is like a, a better, more godly version of Marie Kondo. But there is actually a lot of truth to that. He does go through your heart. And, you know, like when you watch Marie Kondo, these people are like so overwhelmed. They can't seem to get on top of their issues. And she just comes in and she's very, very graceful and it's like it doesn't seem to phase her while she's just pottering around and doing things. That's actually what the Holy Spirit is like in our hearts. He just sweeps through and he's like, hmm, yep, I I can see that. We need to deal with that like this. We need to deal with it like this. And he just graciously, carefully, step by step begins to do things in our heart, right? And the result of that is he brings something to us That's magnificent. Number three, if you're typing on the chat, number three, if you're paying attention, writing notes on a piece of paper somewhere, type number three. If you're driving uh, an airplane over uh, the Atlantic Ocean, say number three, make the co-pilot think you're crazy. Number three, freedom. Freedom, right? And freedom, I know you're thinking, that sounds a little bit odd, but think about it. Have you ever walked into a home that's just spotless? Everything's in its perfect place. It's all well laid out. And there's a scented candle, just even as you're walking through the front door, so you smell that, you're like, oh, that's nice. Then you go into the kitchen and it just smells delicious. There's food being cooked. It's already on the table waiting for you, right? Everything's all good. The kids are peacefully playing in the corner. You know, there's some soft music in the background. You're like, this is incredible. When you eat that meal, you are relaxed like never before. When you have a cup of tea later and you're um, having a slice of cake and you know there's nothing that needs to be done on your to-do list, right? It enables you to focus and enables you to have direction for your tomorrows and your next weeks like you wouldn't have before. But ultimately, I think the best way to sum up that atmosphere on the like one or two days that with a young family I've had that felt like that, the best way to do that to sum it up is freedom. It, It feels freeing. It's freeing to eat a meal and not have 800 things to do. It's freeing to walk through a house and not see a thousand things that need to happen. It's freeing. It changes the way you walk. It changes the way you talk. It changes the way you think, right? And that's what a life of holiness does. That's what the Holy Spirit is trying to do for your heart, right? Because it's hard to have a cup of tea in a Tim Tam when you breathe in and smell rubbish, right? It's hard to think about focus when you don't have a pair of clean socks to put on in the morning, right? You know, and if we don't allow the Holy Spirit to step in and take charge of the cleaning of our heart, what happens is that stuff starts to build up and it conflicts with, you know, us trying to relax and it conflicts with us having focus and direction, right? And this is, if I'm honest, one of my favorite things to watch with new Christians, right? Generally, they're actually way better at this than mature Christians, right? Because what new Christians are like is this. Well, before they get saved, first of all, they don't actually think they have much junk in their heart. Then they get saved, the Holy Spirit turns up and they invite him in as a roommate. And he's like, well, we do have some cleaning to do. What about that? What about this? What about that over there? (laughs) And the thing about the Holy Spirit is he actually, he doesn't point out too many things. He puts out a few things and they're like, oh, yeah. That's a good point. Yeah, okay, I need your help with that. But he doesn't point everything out at once because not only would that be overwhelming, it would actually be quite debilitating. And so he doesn't do that. He points out a few things. So he's like, okay, now that you're a Christian, we've got to stop swearing. We can't use the F word 100 times. We can't do that. It's not good. Got to cut that out. Uh, But then they go, but Holy Spirit, how am I supposed to do it? I've been swearing my whole life. They're like, it's cool. I've got an idea. Why don't we try this? And he gives them a few little simple strategies and he empowers them through his supernatural ability, right? And they make a couple mistakes here or there. And, you know, he's like, I I forgive you. Gives them a hug. 
because let's clean that up. And they continue to go through. And after a couple of weeks, they've stopped swearing. They high five the Holy Spirit. They're like, yay, we did it. We did it. We stopped swearing. And the Holy Spirit is like, yes, we did. That's really, really good. So the next thing that we need to start cleaning up is, you know, that little smoking habit. We kind of need to get on top of that one. And it's like, yeah, but man, I've tried everything. I tried nicotine patches. I tried, I tried all kinds of stuff. I don't even know how to get on top of that. And I went to a thing. I went to a hypnotist once. I still didn't stop smoking. Holy Spirit is like, it's okay. I can help you with that. Here's how I think we do it. And he gently leads them. Then a little while later, the smoking thing is gone. Then they start to do the next thing and the next thing and the next thing and the next thing and the next thing. And then a year later, they look back at their life and they're like, wow, hasn't that changed? And it's like they're walking through this heart. They go into worship. They worship like they haven't before. They read the Bible like they haven't read before. All of these things change in their life because of the freedom of the Holy Spirit, right? Then something a little bit weird happens. I don't know what point along the journey it happens. I don't know if it's you've been a Christian 12 months or two years or five years or 10 years. But some point on the journey, this little weird thing tends to happen. Not with every Christian, but with a lot of Christians, right? We become a little bit too intellectual about the cleaning, right? You know, well, this is the order that we need to do this. We need to get it done like this. And this sin's worse than this sin. So I'm going to get on top of that sin now and I'll deal with that one a little bit later. I've got to get on top of this. Maybe I should do both of them at the same time. And well, you know, I don't know how to tackle this. So I've gone and watched three YouTube videos and I know from looking at three YouTube videos, this is how I need to tackle this sin. And I'm going to do like this and I'm going to do it like that. And, uh, you know, da 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 right? And the thing is, if you actually knew how to sort it out in the first place, you wouldn't even be in this mess. The truth is you actually don't have what it takes to fully get on top of sin in your life. That's why you need the Holy Spirit, right? So what ends up happening when you do that is you're actually doing something subtle that you don't realize. You're taking control of the cleaning off the Holy Spirit and you're picking it back up like before he was in your life, before he was one of your roommates, right? So you invite the Holy Spirit in, he does his thing for a while, and then after a while you're like, I'm a mature believer now, God. I've got this. And you take it back off the Holy Spirit, right? And you start cleaning yourself. The problem with that is you tend to make an even bigger mess. <laughs> I've been there, you know, where it's like, well, you don't have that issue anymore. Yay, good job. But now you've got pride. <laughs> and that's a lot harder of a stain to get out than the other thing that you were cleaning. Well, you don't have that issue anymore. Praise God. Now you've got legalism. That's a whole lot harder to get out than that other thing. Or maybe you don't have that, but a sin issue that you didn't even see coming was creeping up and bang, now has a foothold in your life. You've got an addiction in an area that no one knows about. You've got a struggle in an area that nobody knows about. And these different things sort of creep up in our life, right? And we didn't see any of that coming. And the thing about the Holy Spirit, that's really interesting. It's like I was saying last week, sometimes he's a bit like a quiet introvert. He doesn't yell. He doesn't scream. He doesn't push you out of the way. He doesn't say, listen here, mate, you're doing it all wrong. He just says, all right puts the kettle on, he makes himself a cup of coffee, he walks over to the couch and he says, call me when you're ready. <laughs> and he just sips his coffee on the couch and he waits, and he waits, and he waits. Till finally, the mess is so bad, we come into the living room and we say, hey, Holy Spirit, um, yeah, I'm really sorry. Like it's, it's just been a bit crazy. Um, so if you could, like, there's a mess in the kitchen. It's, it, you know it's bad. It's off the Richter chart. Um, if you could come and help me in the kitchen, that would be really great. And he smiles at you and he says, I say this with love, um, but uh, I'm uh, not going to come and help you in the kitchen because I'm actually not your assistant. <laughs> I'm the Holy Spirit. And uh, I am wanting to help when you're willing to give me back control over the cleaning schedule because right now you're in control and you want me to assist you. That's not how this works. So if you want help, I'll give it to you, but this is what you need to do. You need to apologize, and then you need to say, I give you back control, can you please help? And you pause, you think about the kitchen, which is really bad, and you're like, there's no way I can fix that. I'm completely desperate, I need his help. So you say, Holy Spirit, that's a good point. I'm very sorry about that. You have actually been drinking that coffee for a while and I've been out doing my own thing and so I'm really very sorry. Honestly, I give you back control. Can you please help me? And he smiles, he gives you a great big hug and he says, yes, uh, but we're not gonna start in the kitchen. And you're like, well, what do you mean? And he goes, can you smell that? And you go, actually, yeah, I, I, I do smell something. That, um, that smells a little bit like mold. And he goes, yes, it is mold. It's growing in your hallway. And you can't see it because it's behind a bookshelf. 
but we need to deal with that before we deal with the kitchen because that mold is deadly. The spores are gonna get into your lungs and they're gonna do some damage. So we're gonna need to remove it. Now I know, don't get a fright, we're gonna move this bookshelf. It's quite a nasty stain, but it's cool. I've got the perfect tool for the job. And you're like one of those like cleaning maestros, he pulls this thing out and he's like, we're gonna, we're gonna use this. Don't worry, I've done this before, right? And you partner together and he cleans your heart and he gets things done, right? See, um, the thing about the Holy Spirit is that's his style. That's what he wants to do. So the real question is, especially if you're a mature believer, yes, if you're a new Christian, but especially if you're a mature believer, when was the last time you said to the Holy Spirit, you're in control, what would you like to do? When was the last time you asked the Holy Spirit, is there anything in my life that you want to clean? I'm not saying... No, 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 Holy Spirit, there's a mess in the kitchen. Can you go and fill it, figure it out? Or can you go and sort it out? Don't tell the Holy Spirit what you need help with. When was the last time you actually said to the Holy Spirit, I'm surrendered, what do you need to do? Holy Spirit, I give you control. Is there anything you want to sort out right now, right? Because this is the thing, right? And you understand this as a mature believer. There's so many great things about the Holy Spirit, but he really, really cares deeply about holiness. <laughs> it's in his name. He's the Holy Spirit, right? He really deeply cares about the cleanliness of your heart, right? He cares about that as a roommate. He's that neat freak that lives in your house, right? He, he, he loves that kind of stuff. So you've got to be able to invite him in. The Holy Spirit is in the business of making us more like Jesus. But here's the thing. He knows Jesus better than you do. So allow him the control to mold you into the image of Jesus the way he thinks that needs to happen, right? You know, don't tell him Ask him, right? Um, do what you do when you first got saved, right? Don't assume, ask him. Don't take control, give up control, right? So, but there's one final, one final lifestyle change that he makes because he does all of those three things, which is fantastic and I really like that. You know, and so you, you invite him into your heart, he comes in as a roommate, he's really awesome, gives you a welcome gift, that's really cool, thank you Holy Spirit. And um, then he, he, you know, he, he helps you relax by taking a few things off your to-do list, he gives you some direction, he gives you some focus, he cleans. But the thing that often happens after he finishes cleaning a house is this. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 4. If you've got a Bible, it's the last verse we're going to look at. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 4. If not, we're going to chuck the scripture on the screen. If you're driving and you're just listening to audio, I'm about to read it out on the podcast. Big shout out to all of our podcast listeners. 1 Corinthians 2, 4 says, When I talked with you or preached, I didn't try to prove anything by sounding wise. I simply let God's spirit show his power. What a fascinating verse, huh? Right? So he's talking about the power of God. Cool, we're Pentecostals, we love that, right? But he isn't talking about it as being like a superpower that you can just do anything you want in your whole entire life with and you can just walk around and it's like power, 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 power. You're not Shazam, that's not what he's talking about, right? See, he's talking about that he gives you power with purpose and that is very, very interesting. See, if the only time that you encounter the power of God when you are in desperate need, it means the only time that you really have great God encounters is when your life is a disaster. I've got a life-threatening illness. Now I see a life-changing power. My marriage is almost destroyed. Now I see the spirit of restoration at work, right? I'm completely addicted out of my eyeballs. Now he breaks the power of addiction. If the only way you ever see God move is when your life is a disaster, that's going to lead to a pretty wacky life. It's not that the Holy Spirit can't do that or he doesn't want to do that, but he does have a better idea in mind, which we've got here in this scripture. And it's the last thing that the Holy Spirit and the, as a roommate wants to do in your life. Number four, last point, number four, type it in the chat, say it out aloud. Number four, ministerial power. Ministerial power. A government minister, a politician that's in charge of a ministerial portfolio, right? A government minister has power, but he or she has power for a specific purpose, right? And when they use that power for things that they're not supposed to, we call that an abuse of power, right? Because the ministerial power that they have been granted is on purpose and for a purpose. The same is when the Holy Spirit comes into our life, right? We talk all about supernatural gifts and signs and wonders, and we love moves of God, and we love revival, and we get you know um, outpourings of the Spirit, and we get bogged down in conversations about prophecy and faith gifts, and you know all of that kind of stuff, and I know. I love all of that. I know that it's great. You know I've preached on it before. I think all of that stuff is fantastic. But the thing to remember, right, is as great as all of those gifts are, as far as the Holy Spirit is concerned, those gifts are just tools there to help people. 
And we often get more excited about the gift than the purpose of the gift. And the purpose of the gift is so that the Holy Spirit can utilize it to reach people and minister to people and change people's lives, right? So yes, he gives you supernatural gifts. Yes, he pours out his spirit. Yes, he does things, but he does things on a purpose and for a purpose. And that purpose is ministry, right? That's the thing that he does it, right? The the, the gifts of God, uh, both individually and corporately, are there for the advancement of the kingdom of God in the world, right? So it's there so that people don't rest on their intellectuality or the world doesn't see us as being just intellectual. Although the intellect is great, the brain is great, I'm not against that. But it's not there for that. It's there to prove that we need to rely on the power of God. And I know, I know, I've been around church a while. This is where things get muddled up. Because as soon as I drop the word ministry into the conversation, all kinds of things pop into people's heads, right? All kinds of ideas pop into people's heads, right? But really, there's only two kinds of ministry. If we want to simplify it, right? There's ministry that happens inside the walls of the church. So we're filming this on site at Shiloh right now. And then there's stuff that happens outside the walls of the church. So in our personal life, right? <laughs> and this is where it depends on which group of people I'm talking to, how I choose to tackle it, right? If I'm talking to pastors and leaders, I tend to bang the drum about ministry outside the church because they're pastors or they're key leaders, department leaders or whatever in a church. They understand the value of church ministry. What they can tend to struggle with is the importance of ministry outside the church. And I say to them, it's not just everybody else's job. It's our job for us. We've got to be ministers in our street. We've got to lead our neighbors to Jesus. We've got to witness to our workmates. We've got to pray for our family members that are sick. And I share testimonies of how God heals people outside of the altar call. God heals people when there isn't a keyboard inside. God heals people when there isn't fancy lighting. God heals people when there isn't even a worship team nearby, right? And we talk about all that kind of stuff. And generally, when you hang out with these pastors and key leaders and they listen and they're like, yeah, right. Yeah, I get it. Yep, you're correct. You know what, Holy Spirit? I'm really sorry. Please help me with that, right? And the Holy Spirit does. But when I talk to people who are not pastors and leaders or in a church or whatever, and if you're watching this, you might be like, I'm not one of those people, right? I, I have to talk about the value of church. I talk about the fact that the, the church is God's vehicle for transformation on the earth. It's the only organization that he really created. He didn't create two, an alternative in case you didn't like the church, you could just go and do this, right? That's not what he did at all, right? He didn't set up a, a whole bunch of different vehicles for you to pick and choose, right? He picked one people, one group, one thing, and that's the church, right? And this is normally when I have to explain because people like get all funny about church. And I'm like, no, 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 the church isn't the logo. It isn't the lights. It isn't the carpet. It isn't the sound desk. It isn't the building. It isn't the address. It isn't the brand. It isn't any of those things. The church is people, people who call themselves part of this church or that church, that group of people, that's the church. So when we talk about the church, let's not get funny about it. That's what we're talking about, right? And, um, and, and I think, you know, when, when, I, when I look at people like this, I say, well, look, I love the fact that you're ministering in your biological family. I love the fact that as a dad, you're leading your family and you're speaking to your brother and you're praying for your neighbor and your work. Mate, that's all awesome. Praise God for that. Don't stop doing that because not just me that loves it. The Holy Spirit loves it. He thinks it's fantastic. I just got a little question. What about your spiritual family? Are you ministering in your spiritual family, right? What can you do there, Right. Um, and I know, I know someone's going to be like, well, I'm not a pastor. I don't preach like you and I'm not called to run a department. That's not what I'm going to do. Fair enough. Although <laughs> I would say, I remember saying all those things and look at what I'm doing right now. But putting that aside for a second, um, it, it, pastoring is not the only kind of ministry, right? And that's not the only thing that God gifts people for. If that was the case, our world would be in a lot of trouble. There's all kinds of stuff that happens in the life of the church. There's people on the door and there's people in kids' churches, people who make coffee, there's people who vacuum floor, there's people that you don't even see. They're kind of like almost invisible. They're behind the camera. They're on the other end and editing it and uploading it and making sure that all works. All of those things and a whole lot more is ministry, right? And all of those things are valuable. And I'm here to tell you that not only does God have a ministry for you in your family, in your workplace, with your friends, in your street and all that, in your table tennis, your footy club, whatever it might be. But God has a ministry for you in the church as well. Every single person. Maybe it'll be that, you know, um, physically, you know, you might find it uh, where you're at at the moment in life too hard to do a lot, but you can pray for 15 minutes every day. That's a very, very powerful ministry in the church. One of the things I notice when I go to some churches and they don't have a strong prayer uh, backing is that there are a lot of issues that could be avoided. And they want me to come up with these really crazy leadership things that I'm like, you know what you need to do? Assign a whole bunch of people 15 minutes of prayer every day. It'll make a difference in the life of your church, right? And it might be uh, doing something else. And, And let me just make this clear. 
don't, don't go to the Holy Spirit and tell him, like the kitchen scenario, what you need to do. Holy Spirit, I need to do this. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. No, no, no. Just chill out. Go to the Holy Spirit and say, Holy Spirit, what ministry are you giving me? Because just like he gives you a ministry outside the church, he gives you one inside the church. And you might feel like, well, I'm ready to preach. And he might be like, cool, well, you're ready to make a cup of coffee. Or you might be like, I'm ready to make a cup of coffee. And he's like, cool, well, you're ready to preach, right? You just don't know what the Holy Spirit is going to do. But let him be in charge. Let him be in control, right? And watch what the Holy Spirit does. So usually when I preach to a different group of people, I say that and they're like, yeah, okay, fair enough. All right, Holy Spirit, help me to do that. Okay. Because there's really only two common ways that we see the power of the Holy Spirit at work. The first one is when disaster strikes in our life and we just wait, God, please, I just want disaster to strike so I can see you move. And then some calamity hits us and then he does a miracle. Great. But the other, I think, better way, and I love that thing, by the way. We pray for miracles every week at Shiloh. But but the other way that I think is really cool is when you embrace the ministry that he's given you, both inside the church and outside the church. When you embrace the ministry of the Holy Spirit, he will do wonders. You'd be surprised. You might just be on the door. You might just be witnessing to your neighbor or whatever, but the Holy Spirit will move in power. You will see things if you do it long enough. Trust me, right? So I guess I know you're thinking that's a bit crazy, but Isn't that kind of the fun, crazy lifestyle change you wanted? Isn't that what happens when you invite someone special in as a new roommate? Isn't that the kind of thing? You know, you might be watching this right now and thinking, yeah, man, I'm just, I just need rest. Well, invite the Holy Spirit in as your roommate and let him bring you rest. You might just be running all over the place like a headless chicken. You need the Holy Spirit to bring focus and direction. You might be struggling with some sin stuff right now. In fact, even when I was talking before, I just sensed in my spirit that there's some of you that were like, oh, 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 oh. Because even then you were like, it's like the first time you actually stopped and went into the living room and the Holy Spirit was sipping his coffee. And as soon as you saw him, like he didn't even have to say anything. You were like, I know there's some stuff that needs to happen. Hey, he wants to Marie Kondo your heart, right? He wants to clean all of that stuff up. Um, or, Or maybe it is that ministry thing. Maybe you're like, I'm good with all the other stuff. I just don't want to engage in ministry. I don't want to witness to my family. I hate them. I don't want to witness to my workmates. I hate them. Or I don't want to get involved in church. I've been burnt before. I I get all that. All of these things need the help of the Holy Spirit. You can't achieve proper rest until you learn to lean in on the Holy Spirit. You can't achieve proper focus and direction until you learn to lean in on the Holy Spirit. You can't achieve um, a proper freedom unless you're learning to lean into the Holy Spirit. And you know what? You actually can't receive proper ministerial power unless you lean in on the Holy Spirit. And you might be struggling with any of these. I just want to pray for you that the Holy Spirit actually helps you to do that. But it starts with you inviting Jesus into your life, right? Jesus is the gateway that gets you to the Holy Spirit because the Bible says that God exists, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, right? So you can't pick cherry pick. You can't be like, I'm going to do my own thing. Jesus is going to do his own thing, but I'm going to have the Holy Spirit. It doesn't work like that. It's an all or nothing deal, right? So I want to invite you to, uh, to speak to Jesus and have him in your life. So you might have never done this before. Or you might have done this a hundred times before. And even as I'm saying this, you've just been thinking about the last couple of years and they got a bit crazy and you kind of got a little bit off track, right? Invite God into your life. Invite Jesus in as Lord and Savior. Charlotte Church family, why don't we just thank Pastor Phil for that incredible message. Why don't you leave an emoji, say, thanks, Pastor Phil. I'm sure he's on the chat with us. But right now we're going to come around time of communion. And if you don't know what communion is, because maybe you're here for the first time, someone sent the link to you, simply this week, we gather around these emblems, which represent what Jesus did on the cross and what he talked about with his disciples at a dinner that you've maybe heard of called the Last Supper. He references bread, which he says, this is my body, which will be broken for you eat it in remembrance of me and then he takes some wine and says this is symbolic of my blood which will be poured out for you so you can do this in remembrance of me so we do not by any means when we do this at Shiloh do this out of religious tradition we always take a moment to prioritize this thanking Jesus for what he did because without the finished work of the cross honestly we're nothing so with that in mind we're going to read out of Matthew 26 to 27 verses 27 to 28 out of the passions translation and i want you to pay a close attention to the conversation and what's being said then taking the cup of wine and giving praises to the father he entered into the covenant with them this is jesus saying this is my blood each of you must drink of it in fulfillment of the covenant for this is the blood that seals the new covenant Remember that seals the new covenant. It will be poured out for many for the complete forgiveness of sins. 
I have really great news for you tonight because I don't know how you find yourself on the stream, but I think sometimes even for those that have been going on a journey with Jesus for a while, we've been in this walk, this relationship. I have good news to remind you that we are no longer under the old covenant. I am not trying to work my way to the presence of God. I do not have to go through rituals and sacrifices and blood offerings to get to the presence of God. Because of what Jesus has done, I am no longer under an old covenant. I have been invited into, in participation with what Jesus has initiated. Through his blood, he has put his seal on you and I to be part of this new covenant, one of grace, one of mercy, where it's not based on my works, it's based on the finished work of the cross. The picture that I got as I was preparing for this was like a signet ring, not too dissimilar to the one that I'm wearing when a sender of a letter would want to let people know that the significance of what was being sent, they would grab their ring, they would dip it in some wax and they would seal on the back of that letter letting everyone know this has my approval, this has my seal. Well, in a similar way, when we're invited into the new covenant through the person of Jesus and his blood, he seals that new covenant, that new identity, that new way of living over our lives. That's good news for anyone here this afternoon. So I want to remind you, as we partake of communion, we are not in an old covenant. We're not in works. We're not, we're not under the law. We are under Jesus, the finished work of the cross, the fulfillment of the law, and we get to sit and rest in that grace. So if you have your emblems, why don't you join me now? Let's pray, let's receive, and let's just take a moment to sit in that grace, that free gift, it's grace from God that we cannot boast about, that we cannot work our way into. It is a free gift. It is the free gift of God through the person of Jesus. So Jesus, we come to you right now. And my goodness, are we thankful. We receive and we remember. Wherever we are right now, if we're at home, on the train, in transit, God, we just take a moment and we remember what you did. Jesus, we thank you for not leaving us where we were, for initiating a new covenant, a new way of living and a way of having a relationship with you. We do not take this for granted. We receive this right now in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Hey, well, right now we're going to come around our tithes and our offerings. And I've got a story for you. I want to encourage us around Genesis 22 and I took with full liberty the permission that Pastor Phil gave me on Father's Day when he said, husbands, fathers, if you want to go home and watch a movie tonight, you get to, you get to suggest, you get to have full control of the remote. And even though we don't really watch on a TV, my wife and I, it's amazing we have a TV, but somehow we always find ourselves watching off my iPad or my laptop. It's because we've got a five month old. We have to put the AirPods in. It's a whole thing. Parents, young parents, you understand me. We landed on this. Um, Shout out to my wife, loves action movies. We end up watching the first part of the infamous Avengers Infinity War. So just letting you know, this offering message uh, does have a spoiler in it, but that's 100% on you because the movie's been out for four years. So I take no responsibility for the fact that this might be new news to you. Uh, So I still recommend you to watch it. But Genesis 22, this is how my brain works. I'm watching this movie and there's this moment, Thanos, he's, he's the big bad guy. In order to get what he needs, he finds himself on this planet and he's taken his daughter with him. They go through this treacherous trail and they meet this guy and it's a bit of a throwback to an old movie. And if you're a Marvel fan, you understand the significance of this. If you don't, then it's really lost on you. And that's, I feel for you. I'll pray for you later. And there's this moment where Thanos is told to get the soul stone. It requires a sacrifice and a sacrifice of the thing he loves most. Well, of course, the daughter, um, begrudgingly there, mocks Thanos and says, you don't really love anything. And with tears in his eyes, he actually lays down his daughter on the altar to receive what he wants. Now, I know this may be a stretch, but interestingly enough, that reminded me of a story in Genesis 22 with Abraham and his son. Now, Thanos did this in order to be like a god. 
and he wanted the power. But the interesting thing about Abraham is he had a history with the living God who held and had all power. Literally the son that he's on a journey with and God's having a conversation with him about is from him. So let's pick up that story in Genesis 22, 5 to 15. And it says this, Then Abraham said to his young man, Stay here with the donkey. I and the boy will go over there and worship and come again to you. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac, his son. And he took his hand with the fire and the knife. So they went both of them together. And Isaac said to his father, Abraham, my father. And he said, here I am, my son. He said, behold, the fire and the wood. But where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham said, God will provide for himself the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. So they went both of them together. And they came to the place of which God had told him. Abraham built an altar there and laid the wood in order and bound Isaac, his son, and laid him on the altar on the top of the wood. I do not know what Isaac's thinking in this moment, but my goodness, he has trust in his father. Then Abraham reached out his hand and took the knife and sl- to slaughter his son. But then the angel of the Lord called out from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here I am. He said, do not lay your, your hand on the boy or do anything to him. For now I know and catch this, you fear God. Seeing you have not withheld your son, your only son from me. And Abraham lifted his eyes, looked and behold, behind him was a ram caught in the thicket by his thorns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering and said of his son. So Abraham called the name of that place the Lord will provide. As it is said to this day, on that mount of the Lord, it shall be provided. Now, I know I make light of the story in the Avengers movie, but I think this is a powerful moment. Abraham has such history with God. He knows he is trustworthy. Now, Isaac, he, he's questioning what's going on here, but Abraham has full confidence in this moment. He's like, son, if God said he'll do it, I know he will. And there's three things that I got out of this story that I want to encourage us around today with our giving as we bring of our tithes and give of our offerings is this, Abraham feared God. You may hear that and go, well, man, I thought God's a loving father. I shouldn't be afraid. That's true. But Proverbs talks about how the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. It's a healthy, weighted understanding of I know who I serve and I know where everything that I have comes from. I would rather have a healthy fear of the Lord then have a, a, an unhealthy fear of man and burn my life away working a job that, yes, provides, but does not provide everything that I need. The second thing that I notice is Abraham did not withhold. He didn't debate with God on his request. He acted in obedience. Maybe you felt recently God asked you to give a sum into Miracle Month that you was like, God, that's beyond me. I don't know if I could do that. Can I encourage you today? As I've seen in my own life, time and time again, when God asks something of me, I have a history that I can look back on like Abraham where I know he's been faithful. I can trust him. So he did not withheld or he did not withhold. He gave in obedience. And the third thing, and this is the fruit of when we act in obedience and we have a healthy fear of the Lord, the Lord said, I will provide. He provided the lamb in the thicket. And the place where that happened is called the Lord will provide. God provided what Abraham needed at the time that he needed it. Can I just submit to you today that in the area of our finances, it's so easy for us to stay in control. But when we release it, rightfully giving back God 10%, of what we earn. And then on top of that, with our offerings going, God, I have been blessed. And instead of for selfish gain, I'm not saying unwise use, but selfish gain, we offer it back up to you. Can I just tell you that our father is so faithful, so capable that he sees us right where we are. And even if it gets to the the 11th hour, the 12th hour, God is faithful to go, hey, I see you. I see your heart. I see that you trusted me. Here, I'll provide what you need. The Lord will provide. 
So maybe you've given electronically, maybe you're posting yours in, however you give, let me pray over our finances right now and just declare that over you this week. The Lord will provide. Let's pray. Father, we come to you right now in the name of Jesus and we thank you that you are trustworthy. That is part of your character. That is who you are. You were trustworthy. So as we bring of our tithes and we give of our offerings right now, I thank you that we just receive the blessing and we declare you will provide. God, if people need breakthrough in their finances, in work, God, wherever it is, we pray that in the act of trust to move first, we understand that there is a response of you bringing about what we need, making changes happen, bringing a miracle to fruition. We ask all of this right now in Jesus' name. Amen. See the sun.